Jesus, Lord Jesus, is in this very room. And we hear his words today, the familiar words of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. Before I read the scripture again, um, let me just say a few words about tonight. You know, tonight's a big night. It's one of our national holidays, isn't it? It's the Super Bowl. (laughs) Oh, some people had to be informed. Well, what do you know? Anyway, this is about everything that America holds dear. It's about competition. It's about winners and losers. It is entirely measurable in yards and downs and goals. We have consumerism on display, as the commercials every year are a big deal, right? They are ranked and they are rated. In fact, there's TV shows about the commercials, right? And um, I just read how much 30 seconds cost, you know? $5.6 $5.6 million for 30 seconds. So think about that as you watch a commercial tonight and think, what are they even advertising? Which is what I think sometimes. And then there's the entertainment. This, uh, tonight is going to be J-Lo and uh, Shakira. And then there's the food, the special snacks for tonight. You know, the bean dips and the wings and all that kind of stuff. It is a super holiday. It's been hyped for a week, the past week or so, and then Sunday, it's all over until the next national holiday, which will be what? Valentine's Day. And then it's going to be St. Patrick's Day, and then March Madness. I mean, they just keep on coming. So I say this to you to say that we're sitting here on Sunday morning in a church in Canal Winchester, and we are very counterculture on Sunday morning to what's going to be happening Sunday night. We're going to chew on the words of an itinerant preacher from Nazareth who ministered for three years, 2,000 years ago. Sunday morning is in direct contradiction to Sunday evening in America this week. We're here, of course, because we believe these words are important. And before I read them one more time to you, let me remind you of the context. We are spending this whole year uh, going through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're now in the fifth chapter of Matthew. Jesus has been born. Jesus has been baptized. He was tempted by the devil. He started calling some disciples. And he has just started his ministry. He spoke these words. Um, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. Turn around. He's talking about transformation. And now he teaches us with these words. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. That's an important part, because this is not for the crowds. This is for the disciples then. This is for the disciples now. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. And so this is the first of many descriptions, as we're going to hear in the teachings of Jesus over the course of this year, of the kingdom of God. This is about the kingdom of God, the way of Jesus, the blessed way of living with Jesus, following Jesus. And I would tell you this, it is the way of pure gift. It's a way of pure gift. There is a word, and I wrote it in your sermon notes, the, the uh, Greek word makarios. It means blessing. It means supremely blessed. That's what that word means, supremely blessed. And when the people heard it, they knew the word, but it was usually referred to the gods, the blessing of the gods, or the elite, the powerful people. Matthew, or Jesus, I should say, turns it upside down when he says to them, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. He pronouncing blessing on the lowly and the poor. Uh, so what he's saying is the elite in God's kingdom are those who are at the bottom of the heap of humanity, which is a radical inversion. And it's, <clears throat> if we can understand it this way, it's the way of gift as opposed to the way of earning. They don't have to do anything. They are blessed. The Beatitudes, now I, I titled this sermon, Beatitudes. Isn't that cute? Beatitudes. Um, but it's because it's about being. It's not the do attitudes. It's how you are. It's your stance of life. How you are with your hands, with your heart, with your mind, with your soul. Are you living open to God's spirit, to the gifts that God wants to give you. It's the way of gift. Now, I'm sure you noticed at the beginning of the story about the Beatitudes, he went up the mountain. The, who went up the mountain in the past, in the Old Testament? Moses. And when Moses went up the mountain, he received the Ten Commandments, right? The laws, the external laws. Um, the parameters of living. That's what the Ten Commandments were. Jesus is referencing that, but he is not legalistic. He's not saying, here are the rules. What Jesus is trying to do is transform us from the inside out. Jesus is trying to change our hearts, our souls, and then the behavior becomes changed. Because we all know people who supposedly do the right thing, but not with the right intent, not with the right heart. Heart. Jesus is about the inside job of changing our hearts. That's what the Beatitudes are about. Now, I have preached on the Beatitudes before, and I'm guessing you've heard sermons on the Beatitudes before. Um, but I've actually done some sermon series on them, so every week I talked about a different one because they are rich. There is so much in them. Um, but today, I'm distilling the whole thing to uh, three points, because I really like doing three points. So <laughs> here's the first one. The first few Beatitudes are about awareness. It's about awareness. Jesus wants to wake them up and say to them, blessed are, not the elite, blessed are in my kingdom the poor in spirit. Why? Because they know they can't do it on their own. Because they know they need God. There's a, an ancient story about, an ancient Jewish story about an old rabbi who said, 
In olden days, there were men who could see the face of God. And his um, apprentice said, well, why don't they anymore? And the rabbi said, because nowadays, nobody stoops so low. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are willing to be vulnerable, to experience their own vulnerability. Uh, the, I, I'm sure some of you know the message by Eugene Peterson, another interpretation of the, of the Bible. This is what he writes about some of these Beatitudes. He writes, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. He writes, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. So we're the poor in spirit. Those times when we wake up in the middle of the night wondering about our parenting, wondering about our health, wondering about our jobs, wondering about our depression. We are the poor in spirit seeking to be comforted. Why? Because we are mourning, because we're not okay. We're the poor in spirit seeking after righteousness because we're confused and lost. We are the poor in spirit seeking mercy because we've messed up again. Living in the kingdom this, that Jesus is trying to help us to see is living honestly and unafraid to face pain, mistakes, loss, confusion. That's what it is to live in the kingdom. This past summer, I got entranced with the writings of Louise Penny. Have any of you read, I know there are some of you here who have read Louise Penny, and this is, this is, yes, this is, this is an advertisement for Louise Penny. I just love, she, uh, it's mysteries are set in, in Quebec, uh, and the person who is solving the mysteries is the beloved Inspector Gamache. Uh, they are not ordinary mysteries because he's not an ordinary detective. He is wise and gracious, and I would say almost Christ-like. And um, he tells every one of his detectives, as he hires detectives who, to train under him, that there are four things that will lead to wisdom. And they mirror for us, I believe, what it is for us to live in poverty of spirit. The four sentences that, he, that we need to learn to say, or we need to start to say, are these. I don't know, I need help, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Those are the four sentences. Okay, it can be wrenching to say some of those sentences. And I wonder, you can think about this, when is the last time that you said, I was wrong, or you said, I'm sorry, or I don't know, or I need help. Do you know how freeing it is, though, to stop pretending that you've got it all together? And to know that God loves you in the midst of everything that you are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's, it, these beatitudes are helping us to have awareness, awareness of our own humanity, our own poverty, and God's spirit and God's love for each one of us. And so the invitation I would have for you is to reflect on your own journey and your own life. And where is it that is your greatest need? What is your greatest vulnerability at this point in your life? So that's the first thing, awareness. Second thing that I would, would mention to you in these Beatitudes and the next few Beatitudes is the will to action. The will to action. The action being to live out the values of the kingdom as God continues to guide us to do so. And so we seek to be pure in heart. Now, pure in heart does not mean perfect. 
but it means focusing our life on God. Kierkegaard has said, purity of heart is to will one thing. It's a single-mindedness. And so when we live as pure of heart, our relationship with God is not just about Sunday morning or prayers at the meals or even just morning devotions. It really is living our lives constantly talking to God, listening for God. That's, that's what it is to be pure in heart. There's a wonderful little book called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, a 17th century monk. And he tried to be aware of God through every waking moment of his life. And this is what he said. Sometimes I imagine myself as a stone in front of a sculpture, in front of a sculptor in which he is trying to form me to be a beautiful statue. Presenting myself before God, I ask him to form the perfect image of my soul and make me entirely like himself. This transformation that we talk about is that all Jesus is trying to do is not make us perfect, just make us like Jesus, to follow the way of Jesus. We act merciful. We are blessed as we extend mercy to others, as mercy has been extended to us. We act like peacemakers, having the courage to speak out, speak truth to power. We care about and we work for justice for other people. There's a, a pretty simple story by Sidney Harris that was written that was uh, written many years ago, uh, back in the day when people read newspapers, bought newspapers, and the story is told that he was visiting a friend who every evening went to a newspaper seller and bought a newspaper. Can you imagine such a thing? Anyway, Sidney accompanies this man to buy the newspaper. And um, on the way, and what he noticed was the newspaper seller was kind of rude, grumpy, sullen. And Sidney commented on this to his friend, and the friend said, Oh, he's like that every night. And Sidney said, Well, why, why do you continue to be so polite to him? And the friend replied, Why should I let him determine how I'm going to act? Why should I let him determine how I'm going to act? When we put ourselves at the feet of our Lord Jesus, what we're saying to him is help me, de you determine how it is that you want me to act. We know, we know that we're always a work in progress and we're always learning and growing and risking our faith in loving and acting the way Jesus would have loved and acted and the way he wants us to live. And so I talk to you about contemplation, awareness of our humanity, and I can talk to you about the, the will to act, living out the values of our kingdom, but there's one more thing that I have to highlight from these Beatitudes. And that third thing is consequences. There's consequences to living in the kingdom. And Jesus said, blessed are you, when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. When we are willed to act by Jesus, it will be much more than just returning politeness to a rude clerk. As we continue to seek to, to be changed by God, our values are going to come in conflict with those around us. And so if we are really trying to hunger and thirst after righteousness and speak out and work out for the underclass and the poor and marginalized, it's possible some people will start to think of us as troublemakers. If we turn the other cheek, if we live with radical generosity, we may be called suckers or doormats or bleeding hearts. I came into ministry, I studied for the ministry in the 80s. And I, in seminary, I was taught by uh, men and women who, who were pastoring in the 60s. And I wonder if I would have had the courage that many of them had during the 60s. Because many of these people preached love and equality and engaged in civil rights work and preached against segregation in our 
in our society and of course in our churches. And of course, they encountered conflict within the congregation and sometimes they lost their jobs because the church itself can persecute the prophets. There are consequences to living the blessed life and it takes courage and perseverance and strength. Now our book group, which meets every other Wednesday at 1.30 and 5, and if you haven't come, it's okay. You can come anytime, and if you haven't read the book, it's okay too. It's just a wonderful discussion, okay. Our book discussion uh, group is reading Everything Belongs by Richard Rohr, and this is what he writes. He writes, I write this in some way to lead you away from normalcy. That's what this journey does. We who follow Jesus may find ourselves not being normal. And here's one thing we do. We go to church on Sunday mornings. Fewer people do that every year. Maybe we pray before meals. Maybe we are willing to be vulnerable. Maybe we seek not the famous and the celebrated, but we really seek out those who are lonely and lost, the ones on the margins. Now I know this, tonight many of us are going to be watching the Super Bowl. We're going to sort of be escaping into that entertainment and it's great watching the athletes and superstars and filling ourselves up with junk food. But this morning, let us hope that we're not escaping, but actually engaging. Let us hope that we are listening to the word for our soul. Let us hope that we are encountering God's gracious mercy and claiming our identity as children of God. And this morning, let us hope that we are not spectators, watching other people have a relationship with God, but participants who know ourselves to be called by name, called into whatever unique path that we're supposed to be on as we follow Jesus. I would say to you, that the goal of this sermon, and actually the goal of our lives with Jesus, is for all of us to be inspired, that's filled with the Spirit, so that we might act to follow the way of Jesus with our eyes wide open, aware of our own poverty of spirit, our own vulnerability, responding with the will to act, and knowing that there will be consequences and yet at the same time, knowing in the deepest part of ourselves that this life, this life of following Jesus is really the best life. I would call it the enchanted life. And know that the B attitudes show us a way to freedom, to purpose, and to blessing upon blessing upon blessing. May it be so. Amen.